This week I've been a little under the weather, so I don't want to use the same microphone as everyone else. And then, you know, so I'll, I'll use something else. Can you turn this up a little bit? Very good to see you. I uh, hope everyone's doing well. It's good, good. So I have, my, I have my hot water here. I don't drink tea. Tea is, I realized last year, I have, I have throat issues for those of you who don't know. And um, uh, I found out last year, I really don't like tea. You know, I, tea's okay, but yeah, it's not my, it's not my thing. And uh, yeah, but so hot water with a couple of uh, cough drops in it, fine enough, it's good enough, so. So please keep me in prayer as I, as I share and um, excuse me, hopefully my voice will last. Amen? Amen. 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 Up a little bit more. Just, yeah, I just don't want to yell. Okay, great. That's better. All right. So uh, we've been going through the book of uh, Genesis and um, uh, last week, Larry preached on uh, Genesis 32 and uh, this week I'm going to preach on Genesis 33. How about that? You know, because um, that's the end of our, that, that was our reading for this week. And um, unbeknownst to me, last week, Larry preached on 32, which I was going to preach on, but that's okay. I'm not holding any resentment because he preached an excellent word. So if you haven't heard it yet, you should go hear it. It was excellent. So um, we're going to go to uh, Genesis 33, all right? So let's, let's uh, can you open up your Bibles with me? Uh, we're going we're gonna to read the whole thing. How about that? Amen. All right, so let's pray first. Dear Lord, we just give you praise and honor. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your love, Lord God. And I just pray that you would, um, uh, Lord, just reveal yourself here today. Reveal yourself here today in Jesus' name. As you do in your word, Lord, and uh, as you do in, your, in, in worship, Lord God, uh, I just pray that you would just uh, uh, let us see your goodness in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so beginning in verse 1, Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in the front, <laughs> Leah and, and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you, he asked. Jacob answered, they are, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all, Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, what's the meaning of all these flocks and, and herds I, I met? To find favor in your, in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Please accept the present that, I, that, that was brought to you. For God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because J Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, let us be on our way. I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are tender and that I must care for the ewes and, and cows and they are nursing their young, that are nursing their young. They, if they are driven hard just one day, all the animals will die. So let my Lord go ahead of his servant um, while I move along slowly at the pace of the flocks and herds before me and the pace of the children until I come to my Lord and Seir. Esau said, then let, let me leave some of my men with you. But why do that, Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Sukkoth, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why this place, the, the place is called Sukkoth. After Jacob came from uh, Padan Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan 
and camped within sight of the city. For a hundred pieces of silver, he bought uh, uh, from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, speak to us today in Jesus' name. So, I read all that. So this is an interesting story. And it makes me think that, you know, we're, we're funny people, you know, in general, especially. You know, especially in this country. We're funny people. And, we, and we're so quick to take offense and so slow to, give, to forgive and, and reconcile. Uh, we're so happy, we sue for, for everything, right? From a cup of coffee to, you know, hurt feelings. And, um, and forgiveness has become a, a lost art. It has, it really has. Now everything about, every, everything now is about uh, revenge and, and getting even, making someone pay, right? Sadly, it's drifted into, to, it's drifted from the secular world into the church today, which is crazy. You know, when we, when we should be loving and, and, and uh, we were often bitter. As we continue you know, on this journey through, uh, through the book of Genesis, I think that uh, we'll find awesome power in the forgiveness and reconciliation in today's passage. Because it's very interesting. Because in Genesis 32, we find Jacob preparing for Esau, right? He finds out that Esau has these, hundred, these 400 guys uh, with him. And, uh, and he was, and Jacob was scared. He had to be really scared because he tricked his brother Esau, right? He deceived him. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he received his birthright. He stole his birthright, right? Um, and, and, he, and everything that was right, rightfully belonging to Esau, he stole it, basically. And then what happened? He ran away, right? He ran away. Uh, especially with, to his uncle's house with the help of his mom. His mom helped him out and said, oh, let's go, you know, let's get out of here. As, after, you got, after you stole everything from your brother, right, because he knew he was going to kill him. You know, he ran, he ran away because he was afraid of Esau. He knew that, that, that at, at that time that if Esau found him, that would be it. He would be like, he would be gone. You know, Esau would kill him. He knew it. Now many years have passed. And Jacob was returning home at the Lord's urging. The Lord told him to go home, go back to the land of his fathers, right? And you know what he had to be, you know what he had to be thinking about, right? You know, I'm sure it was not a, uh, a, a relaxing trip back. You know, it wasn't like a, a leisure trip uh, back home. You know, he was, he kept thinking, you know, what is Esau going to do? It's like, will he kill me? You know, I'm sure that with each step he took, there would be more and more anxiety. More and more anxiety about what's going to happen because when he sees Esau. And put yourself in Esau's shoes, right? How would you have reacted? We would all love to say that we would, been, we would let bygones be bygones, right? We love to say those things. But you know what? We don't really do that a whole lot, do we? We hold all the different things. We hold grudges. We don't, we don't, we don't talk to each other. Now, there are people within, this, you know, within the church, like even in our close-knit community that we have here, yeah, you know, that, that you don't communicate because of something that happened years ago. And they can't even remember. They just know that, you know, yeah, I don't really talk to them, you know, whatever it might be. Think about it. Even if we were in Jacob's shoes, we would have feared the worst because we know, <clears throat> we know what we would have done if we were Esau. We know what we would, do if we would do if we were Esau. Many of us live in fear in our daily lives because of our past, of our past sins. Many of us have been frozen by our, our, our past sins against someone or even more so Pass in, a pass in that someone has committed against us. Been frozen by it. But think about it. How many of us, you know, do not move on in our Christian walks because we can't forgive ourselves for something we've done? 
Or how many of us can't go on, uh, go, there goes some wrong someone has, has done to us? How many times does that happen? You may say, oh, I'm over that. But if we're honest with ourselves, right? If we're honest with, us, with ourselves, we're still holding on. We're still holding on to it. In our passage, Jason, Jacob is preparing for the worst. He's preparing for the worst, right? He divided the people in, two, in, in d different groups, you know, so that Esau would attack one group, so the other group could, could, could escape. And he, he, like he sent people, he sent gifts ahead, he sent flocks and people ahead, and, and you know, just to, to appease him. And he did all these different things, you know, in order for, you know, to make it better for himself. You know, and how often do we imagine the worst? How often do we do that? We give God no credit for the fact that he can heal those wounds and he can fix the problem. We give God no credit. You know, as we move on to, we go into Genesis 33, in our reading for today, uh, where Jacob, you know, sees the 400 men and puts his plan into immediate action, right? He knew it. He knew his family were going to, you know, going to be destroyed or something bad was going to happen. You know, how dare God lead him into such a terrible situation, right? You know, you ever feel that way? Have you ever felt that way? I know I have. You know, God is asking you to do something that you don't want to do. Now, how dare him, right? Who does he think he is? God? What's going on? But we have, but, but we as God's people are to be reconciled to him and to each other. Amen. And we can be reconciled to each other through the love of God. It's the only way. You know, God's love is like a bridge that makes reconciliation possible. If you take away that bridge, the separation remains. Wow, that's hot. <laughs> but it's okay. It's all right. You know, most of us have had broken relationships in our lives. Whether or not that relationship is restored depends on how we handle the situation, right? It's about how we handle the situation. You know, 2 Corinthians uh, 5.18, it says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I want to propose to you that, that God has called us to take the initiative in bringing reconciliation. But bringing rec reconciliation is not as easy as you think. It's not very easy. You know, first, you know, restoring re relationships requires humility. You know, last week, Larry um, spoke on uh, Genesis 32, and he spoke on Jacob's ladder. And he talked about how um, with, the, with Jacob wrestling with God, wrestling with the angel, he was changed. He was completely changed. Excuse me. He was completely changed from that, from that, uh, from that experience. He's a different person. And it's, it's interesting. So he went from uh, being, having a lot of anxiety and he wrestled with God because he's like, we were talking about this last night as well at Kairos, at our young adult group, and um, uh, he was completely, he, he came out a different person, a completely different person, where he was a trickster, he was a deceiver, he was all these things, and he wrestles with God, and God gives him a new name. God changes his name, changes basically who he is, right? And he goes through this transformation in, 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 in 32. And then 33, he sees, he sees Esau coming. The next day, he sees Esau coming. And he's like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? But restore relationships requires humility. And so now Jacob's transformation, he goes through this whole transformation. And after, after wrestling with God, and he's finally ready to meet his brother face to face. Because of that, he's finally ready. You know, his trans... Excuse me. His tr transformation uh, can truly be seen in how he handles his meeting with his brother. Yeah, so, so you notice in verse 3 it says, 
And he, he goes before them, right? He goes ahead of them. And, and the, the, the Jacob before his encounter with God probably would have chosen to stay in the back, stay in the rear, stay in, you know, uh, where he can have more maneuverability, maneuver, maneuverability, I can't even talk, oh my goodness, uh, more, more options or whatever. But you notice, <clears throat> now the text emphasizes that he himself went on ahead. He went ahead of, the, of, of, the, uh, of, his, of his wife and children and the servants. He went from the rear guard to the vanguard. He went from the back to the front. But what he does, really, what he does next really uh, shows his transformation. The rest of verse 3 says, and he bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. He approached his brother, bowed down seven times as he's doing. He's bowed, he keeps continuing to bow, continuing to bow. Takes a couple steps, continuing to bow. You know, here he shows the embodiment of humility. Because the word humility literally means to bow oneself low to the ground. Not only does he bow to, bow to the ground, he does it seven times. Seven times. I wonder if he like tricked his brother seven times when they were younger. I, I don't know. But I don't know. For every time that, you know, I don't know. Uh, anyway. But, uh, but now we must see that, you know, that it, it wasn't necessary for Jacob to do, right? He didn't have to do that. Because remember, even though Jacob seemingly weaseled his you know, blessing away from, from Esau, God had already decided to bless Jacob. He already decided to bless him. He blessed him over Esau. He said that the, younger was, the older was going to serve the younger. The younger was going to be blessed, right? And also remember that God had said that the older, you know, he would serve the younger and, and Jacob would be, when his, Jacob would have been in, within his rights to, uh, to, uh, to come to his brother demanding respect because he had the blessing. It was his blessing. However, he came to him with a spirit of humility. With a spirit of humility. Now, but now look at the results of the, of the humility, right? But Esau ran to meet, his, to meet Jacob and embraced him. He ran and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And he wept. And they wept. They wept. They hadn't seen each other in 20 years. 20 years. Just think about that. If you have a brother, or sister, or family member that you haven't seen in 20 years, you know, because of animosity between the two of you, because, you know, you did something that was, you know, worthy of death, basically, you know, and you haven't seen him in 20 years. It's crazy. Crazy stuff. You know, Jacob could have came to his brother with a holier-than-thou attitude. It could have, and it, and, and it, it could have caused an escal escalation in the hostility between his brother and him. He could have demanded the rights of the, of, of the one with the blessing, but instead he humbled himself and brought restoration. As a result of Jacob's humility, Esau hate, Esau's hatred was replaced with generosity and love. It was replaced with generosity and love. We must be willing to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. Now, when we're faced with, with a strained relationship, you know, we can't stomp our feet and insist that we're right and, uh, and they're wrong. We can't do that. This will not ease the, the strain in the relationship. It will not do that. Just let everyone know. Trust me. You know, it, it will only deepen it. It will not bring you closer together. It will only drive you further apart. You know, excuse me, sometimes it's, it, it's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong, but about who needs, what needs to be done to heal the relationship. That's what it's about. What needs to be done to heal that relationship? That's one thing we have to always keep in our mind. You know, we must do what Jesus did, right? In Philippians 2, 5 and 8, 5 through 8, it says, in our relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used uh, to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the, the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death 
on a cross. You know, Jesus didn't humble himself because he needed to. He didn't have to do that. Jesus didn't humble himself because he had done something wrong, right? Jesus humbled himself because we need it. We need it, not him. Not anything that he's, that, you know, that, that he's done. We need it. We need, we need him to humble himself. If we, want to be, if, we want, if we want there to be reconciliation, we need to be willing to, to swallow our pride, right? Give up our rights and humble ourselves before the other person and God. That's what we need to do. If we're going to be ministers of reconciliation, ministers of the gospel, we must be willing to do what Jesus did. Give up what we, we think we deserve, right? We deserve this. We deserve respect. We res we, uh, anyway, I can go on and on with that. But, uh, but be willing to sacrifice our pride in, in, for the sake of the relationship. You got to do it. You know, in order to, for reconcili re reconciliation to take place, we need, to be, we need to be willing to take the first step. And second, you know, it requires giving God the credit as well. We need to give God the credit. Uh, now, we see a vast difference between the two brothers, right? You may not see it, but I, I see it. So I'm going to talk about it, all right? So one takes the credit for himself, and the other gives all the credit to God. Excuse me. First, we see Jacob giving God all the credit for what he had, for what he had acquired, for what he had. You know, when Esau asked him who was with him, Jacob replied uh, that they were what they were, right? He said, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. That's his response. He doesn't brag about all he has, but he gives the credit where credit is due. He gives it to God. He gives it to the Lord. He accepts that children are not a product of human effort, but a blessing from God. Notice also that he acknowledges that it was, it was not something that, that, that he earned because he speaks about the grace of God. He speaks about the grace of God. We can also see that in verse 10, Jacob even acknowledges the fact that, you know, his brother receiving him kindly was due to the grace of God. Jacob tells his brother, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God. That's what he says. That's how he responds to, to Esau. Jacob's explanation that seeing Esau's face was like seeing the face of God showed he knew that his deliverance from harm by Esau, uh, from harm by Esau, you know, was from God. Esau didn't harm him because of God. That's the only reason why, right? He knew that and he sees that and he, he, he speaks that um, when he sees Esau. You know, at Peniel, uh, Jacob has seen the face of God and was delivered. And that was in, in, verse, in chapter 32. He was delivered when he saw the face of God. On the other hand, notice how Esau responds. When Jacob offers him gifts, Esau says, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Esau never mentions God. Never mentions him once. This is a statement of a person who thinks that he does not, either does not need God or they've achieved all that they have on their own. A lot of people think that way. Oh, you know what? I got what I have because of, you know, all my hard work, all this, all my, my diligence, all this, all that, whatever it might be, you know, and you don't, you don't give God the credit. It wasn't that, it wasn't that, that, that he didn't believe in God, you know, but that he said he pretty much didn't have, uh, uh, he had no room for God in his life. You know, we need to continue to give God the credit for everything. You know, when trying to, uh, to, to achieve reconciliation with someone, we must always recognize the hand of God. We must never take credit for it. We can't take credit for it. Because it's, the only, it's only by the leading of the Holy Spirit that we will even desire reconciliation. It's the only reason why we even desire it. Because that's by the, because of the Holy Spirit in us. Left to ourselves, we wouldn't seek reconciliation. Instead, we would seek vengeance, right? We want to get even. We're going to get back at them. Left to ourselves, we wouldn't want a relationship to be healed. 
but that, but that other person, uh, we, we, we want them to, to suffer for hurting us. Left to ourselves, we will see the other person grovel, right? They come crawling to us on their knees before us so that we will forgive them. That's if, we're, if it's left to ourselves. Because of the Holy Spirit, it's because of the Holy Spirit that we, that we recognize that only Christ's death on the cross, only by Christ's death on the cross that we can stand before God, right? Because of the Holy Spirit, our hearts are moved with compassion instead of revenge. It's all because of the Holy Spirit. And Christ must always give, always get the praise for, for reconciliation. He should always give you know, we should always get the praise for reconciliation. But it also requires facing reality, right? Facing reality. At the end of this war family reunion, not so hot, much better. <laughs> um, and then this, this war family reunion, Esau tries to, pers to, to persuade Jacob to come and live with him, right? He wants him to come live with him. However, Jacob comes, with, comes up with every excuse in the book as to why he can't go with him, which I find very funny. But, you know, he goes, oh no, the children are all tired. I can't go with you. you, you they'll, they'll be too, the, the children are too, they're too young, they're too tired. You know, the fox might die, right? He's like, no, I got to, you know, feed the, feed the cows and the, and, the, and the goats and stuff. It's like, I'll catch up with you later. I'll, I'll, I'll get back with you. Yeah, yeah, I'll get back with you. That's, 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 that's Jacob's response to Esau's wanting him to, to, to go with him. But as, as, Esau, as Esau went away, Jacob went the other way, basically, and built himself a home in Succoth. You know, Esau went south. And Jacob went west because his inheritance was not with his brother. It wasn't there. His inheritance wasn't with his brother, but where God called him to. You know, reconciliation doesn't always mean that things go back the way they were, right? Unfortunately. But in some cases, fortunately. Everything doesn't always go back the way it was. You know, relationships change over time. People change over time, right? I mean, that's the way it is. But Jacob paid for, you know, Jacob goes and pays for property and put, put some roots down over in, uh, in, you know, Canaan. And, you know, and he made, he even made an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. That's what it means. And so even in the midst of all of his anxiety and fear, Jacob found that Esau had forgiven him and the brothers were able to reconcile with each other. You know, one thing I can say about Esau, though, right, is that he did what most of us wouldn't do. You know, he did what most of us would not do. And Esau did what God does. He did what God does. The only time in scripture you can find God in a hurry uh, is, is in the story of the prodigal son. In that story, the prodigal son, you know, the prodigal son, which represents us, right, squandered all of his inheritance. And, w and when he came back home, he came back, you know, just as, you know, just as Jacob did. He came back with the hopes that he could be a servant. But what happened was that he, met, he was met with open arms by the father, which represents God. And that's what Esau did. He put the past behind him because he, was, he had missed his brother. He was ready to welcome him home, welcome him to his home. Isn't it awesome that that's, how, that's, that's exactly how God is? God is exactly like that. He doesn't hold the past against us. You know, he runs to meet us and welcomes us home. You know, what is keeping, you know, you know, What's keeping you from, uh, from being the servant that, that, that you should be? What's keeping us from being that person? 
What is it that you're afraid of that, that God won't forgive? What are we afraid of? Trust me, he'll forgive us. He'll forgive. He loves you, and like Esau was with Jacob, God longs to welcome you back. He, he longs to welcome us in. And we're to remember that, that we're, we're to be like him and be forgiving of others. You know, uh, Matthew 6, 14 and 15, he says, For if you give other people, for if you give other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's pretty, uh, pretty deep stuff, right? You see, to forgive someone in a way that, that honors our Savior is not only to forgive, but to forget. To stop and consider salvation. When we accept Jesus, that, uh, you know, what, what the Lord has done for us, he gives us a clean slate, right? That's what we're supposed to do when it comes to forgiving others. We're, for, we're supposed to forgive as Christ has forgiven us and be done with it. Be done with it. You know, in, our, in our passage today, do you do, do, you, you do <coughs> excuse me? Do you see uh, at any time does, does Esau bring up the past? Esau doesn't bring up the past one time. He doesn't do it. It amazes me how some can can claim to be such ex excellent servants of Christ, but have relationships that go unmended. They go unmended and have, and have hurt feelings that they have not been resolved. I don't understand it. You know, in order to be the servants of Christ, we ought to be, you know, that we ought to be, you know, we have to be right in our relationships. And that means forgiving and forgetting, forgiving others. We have to forgive, you know. Things started fresh and new for Jacob and Esau that day. Jacob had been carrying around some unresolved issues for years, for years. He knew, had done, he knew he'd done wrong. He knew he was wrong, right? He was, he was afraid. He, he, was, he was scared. This guy was scared. He knew he had done wrong. He had, had experienced the consequences of those wrongs as well. He had learned from them. You know, he was now, he was now a stronger person, even with the limp. He was a stronger person. I had given him a new name and a new life. But there was something left undone. He had not sought forgiveness from Esau. But now that this had been done, the freedom that, that, that Jacob experienced was amazing. He, ex he experienced such freedom. It's, it's amazing. Some here today are, are like Jacob, the desperately need to seek forgiveness from another. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a, a business associate. Maybe it's, you know, a friend. Maybe it's, you know, someone right here in this very room. Maybe it's, you know, one of the elders or, you know, well, Dave's not here, but, you know, it could be Dave, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, something has happened that made you angry. You know, I mean, blistering, I mean, really angry. You know, and since then, God has dealt with you, and you have, been, you have learned from the experience, yet you still feel empty. Something remains undone, right? You know, forgiveness, that needs to be done. That needs to take place. You know, to take, take, some, to take time to do that very thing. Don't let another minute go by until you've taken up the issue with, that you have with another, you know? Be in obedience today. Seek the awesome freedom that only forgiveness in Christ can provide. And some of you today might be, be in the position of Esau, right? Might be in the position of Esau. Someone has done wrong, to, wrong and today God has convicted them and they're coming to you for, to seek forgiveness, right? Be like Esau. Don't be stubborn. Don't hold a grudge. Don't, you know... Uh, hold it against them. 
God forgave you of your sins and indiscretion without a second thought. We need to do the same. Be gracious. No, you're good. Be gracious, right? We're, we're a church ready to do some amazing things. We have some things going on. Like, I, I, I can't, the summer's coming up. I, I know it's only February. Um, but we have evangelism in the summertime right out here. We do music on Friday nights and we do worship and, 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 and all these different things. We, we talk to people about the Lord. Uh, we have that coming up. We have Lenten season coming up. We have all these things coming up. Uh, we're fasting and prayer, praying during that time. We have all these things coming up. And I think the Lord, I believe the Lord is going to do something amazing in this, in, in this body. In this body. I believe it. I believe it. You know, we're, we're a church that points to Jesus. We point to him. We need to be like him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all that you do. And Lord, I, I know that we have our struggles with how we uh, uh, deal with different relationships, deal with different things, Lord God. And I just pray that you would um, put it in our hearts. Convict us, Lord God. Urge us, Lord, to... Uh, reconcile with each other to ask for forgiveness Lord that where forgiveness is needed Lord to give to forgive Lord where forgiveness is needed Lord to restore relationships Lord, with each other Lord to not be stubborn Lord God and Father I just pray Lord that you would uh, continue to 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 move us Lord and, and direct us in the way that we should go individually Lord and as a community as a church of believers, Lord, who love you. So, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you just be with us today. I thank you for who you are and all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.